Okay, hello, here we go. My first ever um, YouTube video. Um, so let, let's see how it goes. I'm Ash, I'm ranking albums. Today I'm ranking the studio albums of Pink Floyd. There are 15 of them. I've been a Pink Floyd fan for quite a long time, over 40 years, so um, uh, I've spent a lot of time listening to their stuff. Uh, I'm ranking these in the reverse order of preference, from my least favourite to my favourite. Just a studio album, so there's no live albums or compilation albums here, or box sets or whatever. So, um, yeah, this is my my personal preference. It doesn't really mean anything to anyone else, so it'd be a coincidence if it does. But uh, there you go, all right. On with the show. 15 albums, I'll start at number 15 with my least favourite Floyd album, which is... Where are we? Oh, over there. Division Bell, from 1994. Um, yeah, I think by 1994, um, I had lost interest in Floyd. They were off off the radar for me, really. Um, uh, when I didn't, I didn't actually buy this when it came out. Um, I got it on CD uh, in a box set many years later. So um, I did hear it at the time, um, but it didn't do anything for me. I thought, oh dear, not really much going on there. And I just kind of ignored it, to be honest. Um, I've listened to it since. I've listened to it before doing this list, just to, just to see if it sparks any interest in me. But not really at all. I mean, it didn't, didn't do anything for me, I'm afraid. Um, it's a great sleeve, though. One, with, one thing with Floyd, you can't um, discuss the albums without discussing the artwork as well. This is um, the last um, studio album designed by Storm Thorgerson, who used to be in Hypnosis. Um, those are two great big steel heads were planted in a field in Cambridgeshire. I've actually seen the heads. Uh, I went to the Pink Floyd exhibition at the V&A a few years ago, and they had the steel heads in there, and they're massive. They're about the height of a, a double-decker bus, so um, very impressive. So it was uh, some wooden ones on the back, I think. And then, or the, hang on, no, wooden in the middle, that's right. Yeah, wooden version in the middle, so there's a bit of glare there. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Um, Division Bell. Um, you can see Ely Cathedral at the background. That's where it was. Uh, there was uh, I don't know if it's an urban urban myth or what. Uh, apparently, the contractors put the heads in the wrong place and they couldn't see the cathedral in the right spot, so they had to move them. But that might be a, just a bit of gossip. Okay, number fourteen. We move on twenty years, which is the follow-up to Division Bell. And that is Endless River. Around 2014, which uh, I think is, this is um, pretty much the final Floyd album. I don't think there'll be any more after this. And um, I bought this not long after it was released, um, out of interest. More than anything. It was a big seller. It got to number one in the charts. But yeah, it was a bit um, okay. Studio outtakes from Division Bell, but it does say a lot about my feeling on the Division Bell. That uh, the outtakes were better than the actual album. So um, so there you go. Um, mostly instrumental. Um, it's quite, quite a nice album, pleasant album, very ambient in parts, and I think only one track has vocals on there, I can't really remember. But yeah, it's a bit over long, there's a lot of tracks on here, um, and uh, it's got a nice hypnosis-inspired sleeve, even though it wasn't done by them. Um, and it was nice that it was uh, also done as a tribute to um, Richard Wright, who had passed away a few years before this, and uh, there's a lot of his work featured on here. So that was quite nice that the band did that, really. So, um, yeah, so that's my number 14 pick, Endless River. So move back a bit here because the vinyl's coming on board now. Uh, number 13, and we go all the way back to 1969, and Oh My Now, um, as everyone knows, this is a double album, one album live, one album studio. So it's just a studio album I'm ranking on this part. The, um, the live album is actually really good. It's probably my favourite live Floyd album. Studio album was a bit, I don't know, I mean, at the time I bought into it. Um, it was quite interesting and uh, had a sort of novelty value about it. But uh, of course the, the album is split into four sections, each band member getting their own uh, one half of a side. So it's kind of like four solo tracks really, you know, four solo sections. And yes, yeah, a bit mixed, a bit, a bit gimmicky, a bit uh, self-indulgent, a bit pretentious. Gilmore's section works the best for me, really, but um, I don't know, it's uh, something I don't listen to nowadays, and it was uh, certainly of its time. Um, but uh, like I say, the live album is worth the money for this alone, so uh, it's another um, quite famous sleeve there on the back, the famous shot of the, the roadies with all the gear, 
Uh, I think up there, I think that one there, I think that's Pete Watts, who was uh, the father of Naomi Watts, the uh, actress. So um, I think that shot was taken at Biggin Hill uh, Airfield, but I couldn't be too sure. It might be that Abbott or Blackbush. But uh, there you go, that's number 13 on the gummer. Moving uh, on to the 80s, <coughs> excuse me, um, and next album, number 12 in the list, a final cut from 1983. Oops, get it in there. Uh, yeah, um, this was the uh, the last one with Roger Waters. Richard Wright had left, or been asked to leave. He doesn't feature on this, his first one. And it, yeah, it was, um, I mean, G Gilmore nicknamed it the final straw. It was kind of Roger Waters really taking over all aspects of um, the band, the songwriting, lyrics, um, even the sleeve was designed by him as well, and it was a little bit too much of him, so to the point where a lot of people do see it as a solo album, really. Gilmore does um, play some good guitar parts on it, which is a uh, which is a bonus. It's pretty good. He does see he sings lead lead vocals on one of the songs, not now John, but it is pretty much um, Roger Waters. It's a very wordy album. See all the all the lyrics and the inside there. It's, it's um, no instrumentals or anything. So um, it's very very political. It was at an interesting time in the UK under under Thatcher. It's very anti Thatcher. It's very. Um, very aware of the, all the strikes that were going on and the, uh, the, the nuclear threat was quite big at the time. And I kind of bought into it. In 83, I was a member of CND myself. And uh, But the, over the years, I've kind of thought, oh, no, it's a bit, a bit too much. It doesn't really do much for me now. And another one I don't really play very often. So there you go. That's number 12, Final Cut. Now, number 11, back to the 60s for their second release, Source Full of Secrets. Which is a pretty cool album, actually. I quite like this. It's their only album as a five piece, even though they don't appear on um, any tracks as a five piece. I think the way it's split is uh, Barrett plays on three and Gilmore plays on the other four, seven tracks altogether. And it's, yeah, it's an interesting album. It's uh, of its time, very psychedelic, still quite experimental. Um, a marked difference from the first album, but. Um, it's good. Roger Waters is coming forward as a. He's got set the controls of Heart of the Sun and uh, Let There Be More Light, which were uh, two sort of well known Waters songs. The um, title track is quite experimental and uh, very, quite spacey. It's quite good. But um, yeah, it's got a couple of right songs on there as well. But um, it's okay. And it's also the, the first uh, first ever hypnosis sleeve. Um, Storm Thorgerson, who was uh, in hypnosis with a, a school friend of Gilmore, so that's where the connection came. And you can see it's like a nice collage thing, a um, picture of the band there on the front. Um, all kinds of stuff in there, very psychedelic. On the back, let's see, another collage of the, the band themselves. Not, there's not much information, there's no band lineup on the back here, so, um, and no picture of Barrett, as far as I can tell. So, um, But he was on the album, most, ob most obvious, well, most, most prominently on Jug Band Blues. So, um, there you go, that's number 11. Source Full of Secrets. Right, top ten. Ooh, top ten. And top ten coming in. We go back to the 80s, 1987. A Momentary Lapse of Reason, which... Um, first Post Waters album. Um, uh, to be honest, I was a little bit um, worried about this one when it was first announced. I thought, oh, here we go. It's going to be a Gilmore solo. We've had the Waters solo. But uh, I was pleasantly surprised. It was. Um, I thought it was quite a good album. A bit bombastic in parts, and uh, a lot of the guitar parts kind of harked back to um, his earlier stuff. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. nice album. Oh, incoming. Um, uh, officially, there was only um, Gilmore and Mason were band members at the time, but Richard Wright was on board, but only as a hired hired hand, like a session musician. But um, yeah, it was pretty good, some good tracks. We've got um, Dogs of War, is pretty good. One Slip is one of my favourites on here. Um, Sorrow, which is the final track on side two, has a really good um, guitar intro from Gilmore. I saw them on, on this tour when they came to Manchester, and uh, the, the tracks actually sounded better live. They're really good live as well, so um, it was a good album. Storm Thorgerson, Sleever, Hypnosis uh, disbanded by this time, uh, but Storm Thorgerson has kept on doing quite a lot of the album work, so uh, quite an achievement getting all those beds on a beach before the tide came in, so um, well done, well done, Storm. So there you are, it's number 10. Momentary lapse of reason. Number nine, back to the 70s, early 70s. It doesn't get much earlier than 1970, and it's Atom Heart Mother. Um, 
This was, I'd say, probably their first proper prog kind of album, really. It had the obligatory one track on one side of the title track. Got the rather unusual cow sleeve there, and more cows on the back, of course. Uh, yeah, initially it was their number one number one album. They got to the, uh, number one in the charts in the UK, anyway. And um, it was interesting. There's very, the first side uh, was pretty much all instrumental, with the exception of a choir, if that counts. Um... It was a bit interesting. It had uh, the addition of a brass section, which was uh, arranged by um, a guy called Ron Giesin, who was uh, part of the, I think it was part of the Notting Hill psychedelic scene uh, in the late 60s. He was a bit of in, into the avant garde kind of stuff. Um, there was also a choir on there, John Aldis Choir, and a cellist joined in the fun as well. Um, uh, side two, if they didn't learn their lessons from Mumma Gumma, side two was split into four solo tracks. <laughs> um, although um, you had the If by Roger Waters, which was a nice little acoustic ballad. There was a Summer 68 by Rick Wright and Fat Old Son by Gilmore, which he revived in his solo career when he was doing live shows. Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast closes that side, which is uh, credited to all four members, but I think it was Nick Mason was the, the leading light behind that. But... Um, yeah, all in all, a pretty good album. It's um, a bit gimmicky in parts, lots of sound effects. The recording's a bit muffled on some of it, it's a bit muddy, particularly on the on side one. But um, I think it was produced by Norman Smith, was it? Uh, no, it was produced by Pink Floyd. They did their own production on this, but um, yeah, it's, it's a good album. In, interesting album. Bought it in Woolworths. So that, that's where I got a lot of my early Floyd albums from, because they were the best price. Woolworths in Stockport. So there you go. That's uh, number nine. Right, up to number eight. Now this album is probably a lot higher on a lot of other people's list, but on mine it isn't. It's 79's The Wall. Uh, I must admit, I really, I was really into this when it came out. It was my album of the year for that year. There's the, the front sleeve and there's the back. There was a sticker, a window sticker that was on that. And um, I think when I moved out of my flat at the time, I left it on the window. So I don't know. might still be there, you never know. Um, but yeah, it's one of those albums that uh, it's kind of... Uh, not gone off completely, but it doesn't do that much for me nowadays. Double album, a bit overlong, a bit, a bit bombastic in parts, really. I mean, everyone knows the story, everyone knows the, the hit single and the tracks. Comfort in, comfortably Numb uh, is often quoted as the, the best Floyd track. I must admit, it's got a great Gilmore solo on it. But um, all in all, it's kind of like lost its, lost its pizzazz for me. One thing that was interesting, though, I mean... Um, uh, I was very excited at the time because my favourite cartoonist, Gerald Scarf, was an earmark to do the sleeve, and I was a little bit disappointed with what he came up with somehow. I don't know, it just wasn't um, doing a lot for me, that. Uh, he can do better. Should put a little note on it there, must do better. But uh, I saw the show for this in Earl's Court 40 years ago, and I uh, enjoyed that. It was a brilliant show, brilliantly put together. A uh, real achievement. And uh, then I saw it again. Um, more recently when Roger Waters toured it as a solo artist and uh, pretty much the same show, the same, pretty much the same effects, the wall came tumbling down but uh, with the uh, advanced technology taking place so there you go, that's number 8 number 7, back to the 60s for number 7 and more from 1969 now this was um, their first soundtrack album for Barbet Shodder um it was interesting um, that the the album itself it's a mixture of really good songs and then some obvious tracks that are just incidental music for the film you know things like the Spanish piece and dramatic theme and party sequence but there are some pretty good tracks on here Cirrus Minor which is a a classic that appeared on the Relics um, compilation you've got uh, Green is a Colour Symbol Line all quite nice uh, water songs and then the two tracks that stood out for me when I heard this was the Nile song and the Ibiza Bar which are Pretty much like proto metal. They're um, really heavy, heavy song, heavy for Pink Floyd anyway, and they're really cool. Um, Nile song you hear quite prominently in the film. I've seen the film a couple of times. It's um, not great. It's a bit depressing. It's a bit um, of its time. Very um, in, in a bit of a drug culture, the hedonistic lifestyle. And there aren't many very nice characters in it. <coughs> That's quite a um, tragic ending to do with the drugs. But all in all, it's quite, I think it's quite a good, a good album. Um, 
it's uh, the sleeves, again another hypnosis sleeve, but they were restricted to stills from the film, which I thought they did quite a nice, I think it's called solarisation, that effect. And the funny thing is they've used a um, letter set for that, apparently, and you can actually see the image behind through the through the characters, so that's, uh, that's quite interesting. On the back, another scene from the film. There you go. So yeah, that's um, yeah, a good good album actually. I uh, quite like that. So that's, um, oh, actually another thing. Like this is the only Floyd album I ever bought from B and G Records. So that's, that's, that's it. Um, that's his honour. Right, where are we now? Number number six. Number six is Obscure by Clouds from seventy two. The uh, the second soundtrack album they did for the same director. And actually, this one works better as a standalone album. It's not as obviously a, a soundtrack. Um, there's some really good songs on here. Um, uh, title track's pretty good, instrumental. You've got uh, What's Over Deal, What's uh, The Deal, The Gold It's In The, uh, Free Four, which is a, the famous Water song, which was released as a single. I do have that in a single somewhere. Um, which is one of the few songs I actually remember in the in the film. The lot, a lot of this I don't remember in the film. I saw this film a couple of times. First time I saw it, it was a French film. You know, that's the first time I saw it, it there's no subtitles, so I was struggling to follow the plot. Second time there were subtitles, and then I found out there wasn't really a plot as such. But uh, again, another sort of hippy trippy kind of uh, free love hedonistic film in Papua New Guinea. Um, interesting, interesting film. Cut sleeve is a, a another working of a scene from the film. I can't quite work out some guy jumping on the and uh, on the back. There's a few more shots from the film, but um, yeah, all in all, good and um, nice little, nice little album. Another Woolworth purchase there. So um, that's uh, number six. Let's go by clouds. Top five. Hey, top five. Right, number five. Moving into the back to the sixties, and it's Piper at the Gates of Dawn. First album, the the Sid Barrett lineup in full effect. Now um, I bought this. This is actually I bought this second hand sometime in the mid to late seventies, and uh, there were a lot of versions released of, of this. And I've been going on to find, been trying to find out which version this is, and I can't find this version anywhere. There's little little bits about the label and whatnot, all, all incidental stuff for collectors, and I can't find this one anywhere. So could be a rare one, you never know. But um, it's not, not in too bad condition. It's a bit worn around the around the edges, but uh, it's quite okay. Now it's a it's a really good album. I've actually first heard this when um, they released a nice pair in 1974, which was the double album which featured the the re-release of the first two albums. They this and uh, Source of All Secrets, just cashing in on the success of Dance of the Moon, I think. But um, that's the first time I heard this, and also the first time I ever realised there was a person called Sid Barrett involved with the Floyd. So. Uh, that was, was quite a nice discovery, and it is a great album. It's got some fantastic tracks on. It's got Astronomy Dominate, which is one of my favourite Floyd tracks. Interstellar Overdrive, which when I first heard that, I thought, what the hell? In fact, when I listen to it now, I go, what the hell? Uh, Lucifer Sam, which is always great. Um, the Tilda Mother, Flaming, uh, there's a few silly things on there, like the Gnome and Bike, but uh, yeah, great album. And again, of its time, very psychedelic. Apparently he recorded at the same time the Beatles were recording their uh, Sergeant Pepper at Abbey Road. Both, they both recorded at Abbey Road. And with uh, Vic Singh, I think he's called, the other photographer, doing that cut. 60s special effects on that camera. Which reminds me a little bit of the old Top of the Pops effects he used to have sometimes <laughs> when Pan's people were on. So uh, there you go. That's 1967's Part of the Gets of Dawn is my number five flying album. Number four. Now this one probably is at the top of everyone's uh, list, but with me it's at number four, it's Dark Side of the Moon. Um, I bought this not long after it came out. This is the same copy. Uh, not too bad a nick, uh, a little bit worn around the edges. The spine's totally shot there, look at that. There's nothing left of that. Uh, but yeah, this was, a <clears throat> I mean I loved it obviously when it came out. Um, I, well, I was already into the Floyd a little bit, but this one kind of tipped me over the edge a bit and I really got into them. Um, Bought this from W. H. Smith, one ninety nine, and uh, the first time I listened to it was at my auntie's on her stereo gram. <laughs> so it was quite, it was quite an experience. Had a better quality sound than my older uh, Dancet record player at home, but it's great. I mean, it's, I mean, everyone knows this album. It's one of the biggest selling albums ever of, of any genre. Didn't get to number one in the UK, funnily enough. 
you know, it's got Time on here, which is one of my favourite track on the album. Uh, I love uh, Great Gig in the Sky as well. Brain Damaging Eclipse, uh, a, great, a great ending, that kind of um, concept of, uh, I don't know, madness and life, uh, money, all that kind of stuff, war and death. And, yeah, it's like a loose concept running through it, but it's a great, great album. Um, <clears throat> the downside for me was Money and Us and Them were two tracks I never really loved that much. I like them, but um, they were they were the two that held it back for me on this one, I think, particularly on this little rundown. But yeah, uh, great album, memorable album, very iconic sleeve there, my uh, hypnosis. Stolen from a science, a school science book, which I remember at school. So there you go, front and back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go, that's number four, Dark Side of the Moon. Number three, <coughs> okay, later in the 70s we have Animals coming in at number three. Uh, now this was at the peak of my um, Floydness, I was really into the band, and this album's coming out, I was very excited for it. Uh, I saw them in concert on this tour, um, which was the first time I saw Floyd, it was really good. Uh, they played the whole of this album, and the whole of Wish You Were Here at this show. Um, this was 1977, the year of punk, so... Um, yeah, interesting. Now, my only disappointment was the two of the tracks that are on this I'd actually already heard on a bootleg. <laughs> they were Dogs and Sheep, which were originally called You've Got to Be Crazy and Raving and Drooling. So, slightly different on here, different words, very different words and different arrangement, but they're pretty much the same song, but uh, obviously better recorded. But yeah, it's a great, great album, and uh, also my favourite Floyd Sleeve, the shot of Bassey Power Station there. Designed, um, well, the concept was by uh, Roger, Roger Waters, and um, it was organised by uh, Peter Christofferson, who was a member of Throbbing Gristle and also a member of um, uh, Hypnosis. He helped out with the photography. I think Aubrey Powell was involved in it. Um, Storm Thorgerson wasn't really involved, but he, he said, you may as well just draw the pig on, because you're not going to get it to work. And they didn't get it to work, and they did end up drawing the pig on, so the pig is actually an illustration uh, above the power station there, so um, there you go. And on the back, um, Nick Mason did the uh, graphic letter uh, lettering there. But so uh, Nick Mason, I had that on the, on the T-shirt from the tour. So it's that in there. the inside is just some uh, black and white shots. I imagine taken by Christopherson. Um, it very much reminds me of the kind of stuff I was doing at college at the time. So um, yeah, so I was at I was at art college when this came out, and um, yeah. I was out, I went to see the gig, like I say, and it was just great. I got really involved with that album. Battery Power Station, I um, used to cycle past it every day when I ended up living in London, so it was quite... I always thought of the Floyd when I went past that. Okay, top two. Number two is I Wish You Were Here from 1975. Uh, yeah, this was the big one. Uh, it was just one that came out uh, after Dark Side of the Moon. Because of the success of that, Floyd were like the best band in the world at the time and everyone was waiting for this next album to come out and it didn't disappoint, it's got to number one it's their second number one in the UK and uh, yeah, it is a really good album, I remember buying it I remember actually on the day, it came out on the Saturday uh, in September I think it was, in 75 and everywhere it sold out I was there clutching my paper around and thinking, oh no and uh, Boots the Chemist, who used to sell albums at the time they had, the, had some copies left so I bought it from Boots um, of course it had the original, it came in a big black plastic bag with a sticker on the front and it was all very mysterious. You get the opening up, and it's got this uh, this sleeve here with the uh, burning man. No, no, but I actually prefer the back myself. It was the uh, faceless salesman giving you a transparent record. I've never actually seen any um, transparent versions of this. The inside, of course, has the uh, chiffon scarf with the naked lady behind it, and the, uh, the splashless dive on the other side, which was also on the postcard. But uh, no, no, I've no idea where the postcard has gone. Uh, don't know where that's going at all. Well, yeah, this is obviously it's got Sharon You Crazy Diamond on it, which is the tribute to Sid Barrett. There's all the stories about him too. Well, well, not stories, he actually did because he, he photographed him. He turned up in the studio <laughs> when they were recording that. Um, so, uh, Sharon is one of their sort of, you know, top tracks covering uh, most of the album. They've got um, Welcome to the Machine, Have a Cigar, sung by Roy Harper, and of course, Tad Track, very um, popular track. So. We should be here. Great album, yeah. It was my album of the year, 75, so there you go. And for number one, there's only one thing it can be, really, isn't it? And that is Metal from 1971. My favourite Floyd album, so there you go. It's the first Floyd album I owned. 
bought from Woolworths, of course. And yeah, it's um, just brilliant. I just love this album. It's uh, very dear to me. Very, still the same copy with the uh, textured textured sleeve there. Very nice. Not too bad condition, actually. I bought it in 1973. It's actually in better condition than Dark Side of the Moon. And I bought it a few months earlier. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, I just love the album. It's got Echoes on, of course. Echoes in One of These Days, which is my two favourite favorite Floyd tracks of all time, of course. The other tracks, Pillow of Winds, um, Fearless and Seamus. The only throwaway track is um, uh, Seamus. Oh, Santa Place. Uh, sorry, Santa Place the other track. Yeah, Seamus, though, my last, uh, last track on that one's a bit of a throwaway, but uh, I'll forgive them for that. But, um, yeah, my favourite. And also, of course, um, One of These Days and Echoes are featured heavily in the film Floyd at Pompeii, which I saw soon after. And Well, not soon after. It came out in 1974, I think. So um, that kind of cemented it for me when I saw that. And uh, of course, there are the boys. One of the uh, least glamorous band shots of the time. So uh, there you go. So that's my um, rundown. I um, hope you enjoyed that. So, as I say, it's my first ever go at doing this. So um, hopefully, if it works, I'll do some more. Thank you for being there. So, speak to you soon. Bye.